And our topic today is indeed about the UN and its continued relevance. And of course, in some ways, the issue has been thrown into sharp relief by the ongoing Ukraine crisis. Uh, speaking for myself in a purely personal capacity, I was not terribly happy that when those seven weeks were going by, when the Americans and the British were shouting from the rooftops that an invasion was imminent, that the United Nations didn't take any initiative at that point to stop it. And of course, once the invasion began, and since a permanent member of the Security Council was involved, there was not much the Security Council could do either. One thing that people tend to forget sometimes is that the United Nations isn't uh, a single entity. It is an unusual institution in that it's both a stage and an actor. It's a stage on which the member states play their parts. And when they get together, the UN is little more than a platform for them to negotiate their agreements and their disagreements. When they agree, the UN is transformed into an actor, headed by the Secretary General, his agencies, the peacekeeping troops made available to him, and so on. And that's when the UN as actor can be judged for its success or otherwise. But the UN as stage reflects the world as it is, including the various differences amongst member states. And this is where we might take as our starting point some of the harsher criticism of the, of the United Nations, that it has perhaps been irrelevant in this ongoing crisis uh, at a time when the world was desperately in need of some body to bring about peace. And I'm going to invite each of the panelists, all of whom have had United Nations experience from one perspective or another, uh, two of whom have worked within it as staff, one of whom has worked within it as an ambassador, um, and, um, and one of whom, of course, is relating to it as a minister of foreign affairs, and we will see what they each have to say. I'm going to start with Lakshmi Puri, right in the middle there. Uh, Lakshmi is a, a former Indian diplomat, former uh, Assistant Secretary General of the UN. She's worked in the women and development fields, but she's seen the UN at close quarters for many decades. Lakshmi, your response to this. Thank you might you, all want to move the mic a little closer to you, I think, for some. Yeah. Thank you, Sarshi. And uh, as you rightly said, we need to, first of all, be clear about what the UN is, because the expectations from the UN can then be managed. Uh, so the first thing is that there have been a series of crises. First, the COVID-19, the World War III-like devastation that it caused, the hammer blows from that. Then we have had the Afghanistan uh, crisis. And then on top of that, we have had now the Ukraine-Russia war. Is that the last crisis that will break the UN's back? That's the question. Let me begin by saying that the UN is three UNs. It's the Secretariat and the Secretary General, but it is most of all the member states. And the members and, and the UN is also about we the people. So there are these three components that must work closely together for an effective UN. But more, if you look at the other aspect, more importantly, the UN is just a little more than the sum of the power dynamics of the most influential member states. So how they act or not is going to determine the effectiveness of the UN. And what is the UN's role? The UN and the whole system, along with the BWIs, is meant to be a global governance and rules of the game uh, universe, which is, which is focused on the four big projects of humanity, that is human rights, humanitarian response, sustainable development, and peace and security. But as the UN Secretary General pointed out at uh, uh, UN, at, uh, UN at 75, there are three or two challenges and one achievement which we now seem to have lost as well. So the first challenge is, 
and he pointed this out, and I think it's relevant for the Russia-Ukraine war, that the world has too many multilateral challenges and too few multilateral solutions, which means it's not amenable to multilateral, which is, you know, a um, cumbersome process and interaction. They're not amenable to multilateral solutions. Second, that the UN lacks ambition, scale, and teeth. And where those institutions like the UN Security Council has teeth, it doesn't have the appetite to bite. And that bite comes from two things, political volition, political will of the key member states, in this case the UN Security Council P5 in particular, and the uh, unity of purpose that they demonstrate. So when you don't have this, then the UN will be immobilized, as has been the case in terms of the UN Security Council. But my case is that in the Russia-Ukraine instance, yes, the UN Security Council did not adopt the resolution uh, uh, which was uh, for action in this, uh, in this crisis. But short of that, it has been meeting frequently and trying to address three things, political, uh, the humanitarian, and the, uh, the weapons of mass destruction related issues because those are very important conversations that must happen irrespective of what's happening on the ground. Then the UN General Assembly has adopted three resolutions, one of them uh, suspending uh, Russia from the Human Rights Council. And a series, then the ICJ has given a decision uh, against Russia. The ICC is undertaking investigations then a num the IAEA has passed a number of resolutions on nuclear safety and security, and so on. So the whole UN ecosystem has come together to, in a way, uh, weigh in on this crisis and support the pivotal role of the UN to provide humanitarian assistance, but also to act as a break on some of the uh, concerns that are, uh, are humanity's concerns with regard to this. Thank and you. One, one last point I would like to make is that UN Secretary General's role, and uh, I think uh, you rightly referred to the concern of the former uh, UN officials like you and me and others who have written that, we ri that the UN risks um, it not only irrelevance but extinction. It's an existential crisis that the UN faces right now if the UN Secretary General does not become. He came on a mantra of prevention, but he was, he was I think, taken aback. He has publicly admitted that he did not expect uh, Russia to go to war. So that being the case, and then he has been making very strong statements condemning. So the Russians have found him to be partisan, so there is a whole UN ecosystem which has come together against Russia. So to what extent it can be the peacemaker, but it's uh, very heartening to know he's that right. UNSG is right now in Moscow. In Moscow. He, he's just had lunch with the foreign minister and is going to meet President Putin, but you're right, he, he's going, he has a tough task ahead of him. I'll turn to Daniel Carmon. Daniel is, uh, is, is somebody who's been at the United Nations in various hats um, as, a, as a deputy permanent representative, as an ambassador to the UN, and I think as a director general for the UN at headquarters when he came visiting from Tel Aviv. He's also been an ambassador to India and as an old friend. Uh, Danny, what is your take on this very question? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here discussing an issue that has been transcending throughout uh, the last uh, uh, day or two, uh, many referring to a disappointment from the UN and from the multilateral world. Uh, this was very evident in uh, what we heard in previous um, uh, sessions. I think that the automatic and just response to the question is the UN less and less relevant, the UN 
less and less relevant is the, 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 the automatic question is, of course. That's the short one. Mm. The longest one must take into consideration and understanding, and Lakshmi explained, gave a background of what the UN is all about. The UN is not one, and like you said, it's not one entity with one message. Uh, there are at least two big players uh, or sets of players which should be taken into consideration, which is the Secretariat uh, and the membership, and the same membership which reflects its agreements or non-agreements in the orders or the mandates or the resolutions that are passed into the Secretariat. You cannot have an organization with only one, or with, with, with the implementers and the practitioners and the, let's say, the board of directors or the shareholders, which are the mem member states. I think that during the years, uh, during the years that have passed since the uh, inauguration of the United Nations, the regulations have made uh, uh, the member states uh, very influential, and this is how it should have been done, I guess, very influential in, in, in uh, setting the stage for the Secretariat to be more limited in what it can do. Uh, the Secretariat is comprised of very professional people. I would say that it would be better, if I can suggest, it would be better for the Secretariat for the, people, the professional people at the Secretariat to suggest to the uh, board of directors or the shareholders what should be done in particular um, instances and not be limited by what the mandates of the member states set. Uh, I think it's a very important and sensitive point. Uh, what we have to remember is what the UN and its resolutions and its mandates is a reflection of the membership. The same membership that came, if I can be naive for a second, or try to show a naivete for a second, uh, the member states or the world, when it was set in a visionary way, came to one place to do better for the whole world. And when you come to the United Nations, it takes an hour or two to understand that each one of the member states holds his, 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 his flag very hard, strongly, uh, uh, setting uh, its policy according to its national interests, and that's, this is how it should be. But the result of what is happening at the United Nations is not necessarily doing good for the well-being of the, the whole, whole world. It's disappointing. For the visionaries, it is disappointing. For the founding fathers of the United Nations, it is disappointing. For those who know what the United Nations is all about, both actors and a stage, uh, it, is, it is disappointing, but you have to understand how it came about. Having on the Ukraine uh, uh, crisis, having Russia chair the Security Council meeting, uh, which in any conflict, any, any, any war that is happening, there is after a few hours a meeting of the Security Council, and for a call for a cessation of hostilities, etc., etc. We know it. We've been there many times at the right. Security Council. Uh, uh, having the participant, the aggressor, chair the meeting is more than ridiculous. Uh, but this is how the United Nations regulation is. Uh, uh, having resolutions that call in setting resolutions, there is a need for a consensus. The consensus, by definition, brings the resolutions to be, to be weaker than the initial idea of setting a, a mandate and a resolution. So what, what I'm trying to say is the United Nations is comprised of many kinds of, I would say, tensions between developed and developing, between uh, secretariat and membership, uh, between those who fund 
the budget of the United Nations, yeah. which are 8% of the countries, and those who make the decisions, which are around 80% of uh, the member states in the General Assembly, in the General Assembly yeah. who, ma who make the, the, the resolution. There are sets of tensions that have to be understood before we come and analyze and uh, judge the activity or the non-activity of the United Nations. Okay, well that's a right segue into our next speaker. Ararat Mirzoyan is the Foreign Minister of Armenia and as a, the one person here who currently represents a member state at the UN. Uh, how would you react to this question about the UN's relevance? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to take part in this conversation today at Raisina uh, Dialogue and uh, exchange thoughts and uh, views about the um, possible crisis of multilateralism, uh, its, its strengths also, but also the challenges it faces. I should state that uh, my country, Armenia, uh, has been a strong believer uh, and, and, and an active uh, uh, supporter of multilateralism since, regain, since regaining its independence in 1991, and a believer and a supporter in multilateralism, in international organizations, in the role that they play uh, uh, in sustainable development, in preventing and overcoming crisis and so on. Um, and coming to the main topic of today's conversation, to the possible crisis of multilateralism, I should say that um, firstly, probably we should uh, um, define uh, what we mean by saying multilateralism and the crisis of multilateralism. Um, are the regional organizations, um, political, military blocs, uh, part of this crisis, or we are speaking about, or we, this is uh, limited only to the organizations with universal representations, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in particular uh, about the United Nations. Uh, so uh, uh, I should uh, also suggest to recall the history of creation of United Nations. The United Nations organization, the United Nations is a, um, is a child of war. Uh, it was born on the ashes of Second World War and, uh, and uh, uh, with the promise to prevent f um, the horrors of that war ever being repeated. Uh, um, and we should, I think, remember that we are not speaking only about an institution which operates uh, uh, across the globe, but uh, it, to me at least, it's first of all the uh, commitment of humankind uh, to prevent future catastrophes, uh, uh, calamities, wars, horrors. Unfortunately, I should of course say that uh, during the uh, seven decades of the existence of the United Nations, including the Security Council, we have been witnessing wars, calamities, catastrophes. So uh, is this enough to assume that uh, um, the United Nations has overlived its purpose? Uh, I think no. I think no. Uh, and and uh, uh, nowadays, when the world challenges uh, huge, uh, uh, faces huge challenges, starting from uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, global um, uh, climate change to new military clashes, we should uh, remain. Um, uh, we remain. We should keep the uh, system of uh, multilateral uh, diplomacy. Uh, but also, at the same time, uh, I think that we should understand that uh, the organization, the system, should not keep working in a business-as-usual mode. Mm -hmm. We should also understand that the system uh, needs reforms. And, and, uh, and we should also, uh, as a humanity, as a mankind, united, we should rethink and probably suggest new uh, new, new ways of acting, of operating the system. Can you suggest a way? Oh. One example. <laughs> it's, I think, uh, 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 just a bit more uh, uh, level of responsibility that I would like, I, I would prefer to take on my shoulders, but probably we can uh, uh, discuss and find one together. Jointly. Okay, well, I'll come back to the, the panel on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. Jane. Uh, Jane Holdut is somebody who's seen the UN both from the inside and from the outside. She's been an Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. We worked together many years ago. 
and she's also been the senior official of the U.S. Department of Defense. Is that right? Homeland Security. Homeland Security. Well, uh, keeping, keeping the U.S. safe from terrorism. So she knows peace and security issues. You must have watched what's going on in the war, which is more than uh, amateur interest. Tell us, Jane, how do you see the UN's role so far and what should it be doing? Uh, thanks, Shashid. I should say I'm speaking in only a personal capacity here. And All of I, us. Am, I am an unapologetic advocate for the United Nations. Um, and, I, and I don't apologize for that. In fact, I feel strongly about it. If we didn't have it, we would have to invent it. The UN is, is irrelevant compared to what? I mean, let's talk about the world in 1945 when the UN was founded. 50 countries originally, and then Poland, 51 countries are founding members of the United Nations. There are over 190, 193 members today. The world's population is nearly triple what it was in those days. And the world's population is healthier, wealthier, more mobile, more educated, and deminiaturized to a greater extent than ever before. The advent of technology and the proliferation of the internet has allowed us all to deminiaturize ourselves in spite of whatever box our societies or our governments would like to put us in. And we're reveling in that deminiaturization. Um, but all governments are, are really having a struggle with this. I mean, my colleagues have talked rightly, in my view, about how the United Nations is a member state organization. And let's talk about the role of government in our lives. I mean, personally, I don't know anybody who interacts with government unless they have to. <laughs> okay, and the UN has to. But the government, government has lost the corner on the market on the three areas that really used to define their competence. The control of lethality, the control of capital, and the control of rulemaking. Now, we can be honest and say that governments have never, ever been really very good at reaching either the very rich or the very poor. It's almost has been beyond their grasp. But we, for much of the world's history, we lived in a world where people sought the protection of their sovereigns from marauding outsiders. And lately, it seems that people need the protection of outsiders from marauding sovereigns. <laughs> now, the UN is essential for all the reasons both, both my colleagues and all my colleagues have said before. But let's think about a global forum where we can come together on a basis of shared principles, every treaty organization, whether it's the Organization of American States, the Organization of African Union, the European Union, or NATO, Article I from every treaty that founded those organizations proceeds from the Charter of the United Nations and the principles that are embodied therein. So is this organization irrelevant? Not at all, in my view. Not at all. Gosh, Jane, that's yeah. a wonderfully robust yeah. defense of the United Nations. Yeah. Many, <laughs> many thanks. And um, we'll turn to our final panelists, and I want to come back to each of you for a minute. But uh, meanwhile, those who wish to ask questions can already begin to think about it. Our final panelist is Charles Kupchin, who, unlike the other four, hasn't ever worked for the UN, as far as I remember, but has uh, been a very distinguished public commentator on global geopolitics and, therefore, on the UN's role in it. And Charles, I'd welcome your comments on the larger question and on what you've heard. Thank you, Shashi. Pleasure to uh, join my colleagues on this panel. You could push uh, the mic a little closer to you? Yes. Yeah, um, I share Jane's appreciation of the value of the United Nations, but I'm going to offer a, a somewhat different take on where we are today. Uh, and I want to make a, one core argument, and that is that we're headed into a period of history in which the demand for global governance and the supply of global governance will be as wide mm -hmm. as at any point in history. And figuring out how to fill that gap is something that all of us who care about the world need to, to uh, take on. And I come to that conclusion through the following set of observations. One, and this I think the Ukraine war kind of brings these points home. We are moving into a, an era in which there will be new geopolitical division mm -hmm. in a world in which power is much more widely distributed than it's been really since the 18th century. Uh, and that's because ever since 
the end of the Napoleonic Wars, we've seen power swing to the north and to the west, and Europe and or North America have sort of been dominating power centers, even during the Cold War. Yeah. But we're now headed to a world it, probably in which there will be two big blocks, a liberal international order on one side, an autocratic capitalist order on the other side. That other order will be anchored by China. China will soon have the world's largest economy. So we will be in a world in which there are two full-service blocks that don't take the same basic approach to either domestic or international governance. Number two, as we are seeing in this war, there are a lot of countries that aren't going to take sides. Jane and I were talking just before we came into the room, there are only 41 countries in the world that have joined the sanctions regime. That means most countries in the world, including India, including Israel, including most of Africa, including most of South America, Southeast Asia, are sitting on the fence. They're not going to say, we're going with the liberal international order, we're not going to go with the autocratic capitalist order, we're going to take it day by day. Right? So that means we're headed into a world in which power is not only more diffused into two big blocks, but it's effectively multipolar, because a lot of countries aren't going to say, I'm with that block or I'm with that block. Third observation, even though I'm bullish about the strength and durability of the liberal international order, it ain't what it used to be. We had a panel earlier today mm -hmm. about populism and liberalism. This is here to stay, right? We're looking at a, a kind of more polarized, more difficult, more dysfunctional liberal democratic West than we are used to. And the United States, which has been the main driver of liberal multilateralism since World War II, is going to have trouble playing that role when it's almost impossible for the foreseeable future to get any significant treaty ratified by the U.S. Senate. Absolutely. And that's simply because the political landscape has changed. Right? If the five of us or the six of us drove down to Capitol Hill next week and presented the World War II settlement to Congress, NATO, UN, World Bank, IMF, the Bretton Woods system, they'd laugh us out of the place, right? And that's because the, the country has changed. And so there isn't the same readiness politically to get out there and build multilateral institutions as there used to be. So for all those three reasons, I think that uh, we're going to live in a world that is less conducive to the provision of, of public goods than the one we're, we're leaving behind. Two, the demand for those public goods is greater than ever. And that's simply because we are ir irretrievably, inescapably interdependent. Even if we start to decouple as a consequence of the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. climate change, nuclear proliferation, global health and pandemics, you name it, we can't solve it if we don't come together and act as a team. That's going to be more and more difficult, and that brings me to my conclusion. The UN is perfect. If, I agree with Jane, if it didn't e exist, we'd have to create it, but you can't fix it. And that's because people join it because they're comfortable with it, because it has a veto. All the things that prevent it from addressing these big global governance problems are the reason that it works, that people continue to adhere to it. And so we can reform it here and there, but we're not going to be able to reform it in a way that fundamentally addresses the underlying sources of the problem. And that's why I think we need to look for the UN plus. We need to look for other modalities, other kinds of institutional innovations that will help us fill this gap. My personal preference is to start building what I would call concerts, small groups of countries that come together to tackle global problems, that cuts across ideological dividing lines, because we are going to have to talk to Russia, whether Putin is a war criminal or not. We are going to have to talk to the Chinese, whether they support the, Ch the Russians, because that's the world that we live in. And that's going to take small group countries coming together, in some cases putting not just the liberal <coughs> powers and, power and, and liberal powers at the table. What about CEOs? What about NGOs? What about civil society, right? They have to be at the table. So I just think we're going to have to think more creatively 
about how to put together packages of countries that need to be there discussing to tackle global problems. Great. So we've really had all our panelists pretty much agreeing that the UN is indispensable, and I think it's difficult to disagree with that. And as both uh, Jane and Charles have just pointed out, it probably couldn't be invented today, so we, we better keep the one we've got. Um, in fact, the fact that the UN is imperfect has been acknowledged all along. There's that wonderful line from the UN Second Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, who said the UN was not created to take mankind to paradise but rather to save humanity from hell. In other words, sometimes the best it can do is to prevent things from getting worse. It can't necessarily wave a magic wand and solve the problems of the planet. And we're seeing that right now here. But before I take questions from the audience, I'll ask for very short answers to one simple question. One of the propositions that's there in the booklet about our panel is that in a world in which sovereignty and sovereign states are becoming less and less relevant because so many things are happening beyond the ken of sovereign states, as Jane also said. The question that comes up is, is the UN founded as it is on sovereign states suffering a fatal fundamental flaw? Do we need to augment the UN with something that tries to bring together the various non-sovereign state entities that are really having a tremendous impact on all our lives? This time I'll just go in order in terms of proxy. Start with Jane and move eastward. So, 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 two quick points. I mean, I, I think this whole notion that sovereignty is weakening is kind of overblown. Sovereignty is not what Jane, you... can you pull it? Oh, sorry. I can't hear you. Sovereignty is not what you say you are. Sovereignty is what we say you are, in spite of what you are. So, I, I think sovereignty is alive and well, point one. Point two, there's an expectation, I think, that the UN would, would somehow be directive. And as you say, there is no swish and flick here, right? I mean, that it's somehow strategic, centralized, and top-driven global governance. I mean, I can't think of three more useless words in the English language to describe the world in which we live than strategic, centralized, and top-driven. This world is transactional, decentralized, and bottom-driven. And the name of the game is still states. Still states. Okay. Mr. Minister, you have an easy task. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, no, why? Um, uh, you asked for a short answer, so my answer is that, uh, uh, of course, I agree. I agree uh, it weakens the sovereignty of the states, and here I would recall the previous uh, remark about being interconnected and interdependent. Uh, but also, on the other hand, we see that sometimes uh, very particular sovereign states can allow themselves to do whatever they want to do. And here we will come to the conversation about the rules that should be established and respected uh, by everyone. Mm -hmm. And what do you do if they don't respect the rules? That's, isn't that always a problem? What do you do if a, if a powerful state doesn't respect the rules you've all agreed to? Uh -huh. uh, so <laughs> now we can speak about the great powers. Historically, what does the gre uh, great power mean? It's, uh, it's not only a power who, has, uh, who had a... Uh, uh, who had been victorious in a recent war and, and uh, has gained some advantages, but also, of course, they have uh, this uh, great power can have the, uh, its own interest, its own economic, political uh, influence, but also it means, and it, ha it has always uh, mean, meant uh, responsibility for mm -hmm. others. So if we allow some of the club, some members of the club, to be great powers, we also should stay, uh, well, we, uh, should, should um, uh, make them remember all the time that they have responsibility. You speak about the situation in Ukraine. Here, as a foreign affairs minister of Republic of Armenia and an ordinary Armenian, I would recall the audience about the war which took place two years ago in Nagorno-Karabakh, in our region. And can you please say, can you raise hands, how many of you uh, knew about it? How many of you spoke about it? And how many of you demanded from the United Nations to, to act to prevent uh, new ethnic cleansing of Armenians against Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh? Please raise your hands. I don't see any. Oh, you had one or two there. Yeah, the Armenian delegation. <laughs> Thank you for the others. There's the answer. And you. now, uh, please persuade me to speak about the other conflicts. Fair point. Good illustration. Lakshmi. It is a creative destruction moment. 
in so many ways, including on the shifting frontiers and definitions, you know, the shape-shifting frontiers of, of sovereignty that we have been uh, talking about. But that's why I want to really push in on the whole issue of how we should be reinventing the UN, going back to the drawing board, Article 108 and 109 of the Charter, and address all these issues. Remind us what 108 and 109 tell us. <laughs> no, it is about the review of the Charter. You can convene a conference, and the world has to be reimagined. The, the world order has to be reimagined. But we've and tried for 30 years to reform the Security Council. Exactly. What makes you think we can but do now, it? now, now is the, you know, the crisis. Let's not let, let's not uh, <laughs> let the crisis go to waste. <laughs> right. Let's use it. Mandate review, making it more independent, making it uh, technically more able, because we are now hobbled by many, you know that by many of these uh, kind of rules uh, which don't make us the, the centers of excellence that we must be and, and the independence that we must have. So all of that has to be, and UN Security Council has to be expanded and reformed, um, and that should be, I think, the lesson as well. If I may just add one thing about the, what I feel is um, the way this Russia-Ukraine uh, war and its perceptions are, are moving, this, is, this could be a reprise of the end of history of Francis Fuku Fukuyama, mm -hmm. because I think you spoke about the authority and, and the democracy divide. So are we in that moment, in which case then we need to, uh, you know, come together and reimagine it? Thank you, Lakshmi. Danny. I saw you smiling when Lakshmi's enthusiasm for a review came up. When talking Is that a cynical the... smile I see there? <laughs> Maybe it's a realistic one. Having been a practitioner at the United Nations, we've had a lot of conversation with the Secretariat people uh, about adapting uh, the United Nations to our times and taking into consideration the limitations uh, that are set by the member states themselves which brings all of us to lower the expectation. I mean, those who thought that the United Nations could be solve peace and security issues, maybe it's visionary, but it didn't happen 70 years. For 70 years, the United Nations uh, knew how to safeguard peace, how to keep peace, but not to broker the peace. Mm. Mm. That's a big, big uh, difference, and there is a misinterpretation of, not of the role, but of the capabilities of the United Nations to be on the uh, negotiating table of how to make peace between uh, uh, enemies. Uh, this is right on all fronts. This is right in crises that we don't hear about, Mr. Foyer Minister, and you so right, rightly said, uh, conflicts in Africa, there are hundreds of conflicts in Africa. They are maybe mentioned in speeches at the United Nations, but not in the activities of the United Nations. This is one. On the other hand, you have crisis, crises that are uh, overexposed at the United Nations without any uh, proportion, only because the member states and their dynamics with the group dynamics in the United Nations bring those to the agenda of the United Nations, uh, uh, forgetting other uh, conflicts. But the United Nations as such is very much aware of the need to reform, to reinvent itself in various aspects. I'm not an advocate of the United Nations. I'm more of a critic of the United Nations uh, for various reasons, but I do believe <laughs> The United, you, you, and you know the reasons. <laughs> we do believe, uh, I do believe that it must um, uh, sustain, it must continue to be not as it is. Uh, in a previous session, uh, someone suggested to reboot the United Nations. I feel rebooting the United Nations would bring uh, a new organization more of the same, uh, but it must continue to be uh, a stage and there must, it must continue to be a, a, a sitting table for the actors. 
uh, we only have to understand the limitations and be with realistic expectations. Understand the limitations. Okay, Charlie, you're the non-practitioner here. Tell us your take on, on this last round. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, a dual movement today, Shashi, in which, in which sovereignty, traditional sovereignty is being restored in many respects. States are getting stronger, and that's because they are reacting against globalization. Uh, and you see it most clearly in people like Trump and Le Pen and Kaczynski, but you also see those on the center left doing the same thing because they are being driven to by domestic politics. So Biden came in wanting to practice a much more liberal immigration policy, but he has had to pull back and raise the country's borders, if you will, in, in part because that's where domestic politics is pushing him. Uh, and so I think we, we're, we're living in a world in which states and state authorities will still be the drivers uh, and, and I think one, th one thing that I, that I think we, we miss, and this comes to this, this attribute of the, of, the, of the Security Council as a stage, it's too much of a stage. We don't have a place where on a sustained daily basis we're getting real conversation among the United States and India and Russia and China, and I think we, we need that. Mm -hmm. uh, and might we have been able to avoid the Russian invasion of Ukraine if there had been that sustained dialogue? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. It certainly wouldn't have hurt. And it just, it's not enough to have Biden get on the phone with Putin every three or four months, or have the G20 or the G7 fly in once every six months to do a scripted handshake and issue a communique and leave. That's not enough. We, we really do need to have a place that serves yeah. like the Security Council, but is more than a place where people go to give speeches and grandstand. And at the same time, Shashi, there is this movement that Jane referred to that's, that's very much bottom up, right? I mean, if we were gonna have a conversation about one of the key issues of our time, which is digital governance, mm -hmm. who has to be there? Well, Elon Musk, who just bought Twitter. Why? Because if he's not there, you're going to miss a big piece of, of social media. So states are back, but we have to have at the table other key players because they affect outcomes. Sure, Charlie, but one thing is true. I mean, the Security Council isn't only the member states delivering scripted speeches. There's a lot that goes on in the so-called informal consultations chamber before they actually go on yeah. in front of the TV cameras, and they do talk, frankly, to each other. And that's part of what the UN is all about. But we're running out of time, and I'm sure there are questions in the audience. There are mics, as you know, in the hall. Walk up to the mic, and we will, whoever reaches the mic first can start. Yeah, you just walk up to the mics. Line up the Hello. mics in three places in the hall. Line up, and yep. whoever is first can start. Quick. I'd like to take four or five questions quickly, but keep them short, please. Go ahead. Tell us who you are and ask your question. This is Ayan. I'm a foreign affairs journalist. Will uh, the rise of right wing, especially the hyper nationalism across the developing state, uh, infect United Nations? Okay. That's my question. Hello. Uh, hyper nationalism. You, you, you're next, young lady. Hi, my name is Lydia. I'm SVP for Emerging Tech Insights at Nova 4. My question is um, to Elon Musk Do you think that now people like Elon Musk, billionaires, Jeff Bezos, will need to have their own teams that interact with diplomats, their own protocol teams. That ordinary people should react, we should be able to react to diplomats? I didn't quite hear that perfectly. Um, so, for example, Microsoft has a government team that liaises with government. Um, should now Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and others, billionaires of this kind that are having an impact on our world, have their own team of diplomats to interact with nation states. Right, interesting. Okay, uh, there's a third mic here. Yes, go ahead. First person at the mic. And then Hello. we'll come back to, yeah. Hello, I'm Arif Nizami from Bangladesh. And Mr. Saru, we have a great fan base in Bangladesh, so it's great to be with you in the same session. Uh, so I wanted to ask that we are talking about we need a reform in the UN. And uh, so who is going to make the reform? Because we know we have like big brothers with the veto power who keep you know, providing veto to everything that's good or bad, uh, number one. And Bangladesh is also the largest US peacekeeping you know, uh, ses I mean, country sending uh, peacekeepers. So is that any possibility in future of the UN you know, peacekeeping actually like trying to protect 
uh, different countries not invading each other. So is there any possibility in future? Thank you very much. Okay. The young lady here again. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists and to the moderator, of course. My name is uh, Lynn Kwok, and I'm uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia-Pacific Security. My question is directed to uh, Professor Charlie Kupchin. Uh, since your article in Foreign Affairs um, with uh, Richard Haas uh, calling for a new concert of powers, we've had the China-Russia joint statement as well as the war in Ukraine, both of which, in my view, has hardened geopolitical competition um, along ideological lines. Um, how do you think that, um, how do you think these developments impact on your call for small groups of countries to come together to fix problems across ideological lines? Because, you know, there seems to be no meeting of the twain. Okay, the gentleman here, and then we'll finally go to that lady there. That'll be the end. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Madalit Supiri, I'm, I'm uh, based in South Africa. Uh, my question is to all the members of the panel, please feel free. Uh, I think one of the things that we've underestimated is that uh, the whole organization of the world is a global racial polity, and it's based on uh, unequal power relations that are predicated on, on, on race. And the UN is actually implicated in that project. Um, so I, I just want to, to get a sense of your views how do we go about building institutions that are post-imperial, that focus on nation building at the very same time and making the world of empire? I think that is the, the, the questions that we need to be asking. We can okay. live in this happy cloud that the world has actually become more wealthier and prosperous, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, and, and, the, and the version of what peace uh, was predicated on building a, a, a specific world that reflects specific values about certain groups of people and other people are not actually included in that project. Okay, and the final one is a the lady there. Uh, good Go good ahead. afternoon, everyone. I'm Umar Wara. I teach criminology in University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. I have been researching on Rohingya issues. That's why this question came into my mind while listening to all of you. Uh, since more than one million Rohingya refugees have been living in Bangladeshi camps for the last five years almost, uh, my question is, uh, there are some short-term solutions that are going on, uh, giving them relief, aid, and making them comfortable as being re Rohingya refugees, but they are not supposed to be as refugees. They need to go back to their own country. So my question is that if we uh, look at the formal mechanism like ICJ, ICC, we know that Myanmar is not a state party of ICC, and uh, they think Gambia does not have a legal stand in ICJ. Uh, we know about the Security Council. Again, if we need to look into the informal mechanism like uh, repatriation, reconciliation, reparation, they need to go back to their own country. So except giving them relief aid by UN, it's another relevant organization and making them comfortable as refugees, what UN can actually play a role for a long-term solution and uh, take them back to their own country? Okay, Thank thanks you. very much. We have barely two minutes left in the, in the official time, so I'm going to ask everyone, we can't answer all these very thoughtful, searching questions in the time available, but I'll ask each of our panelists to make a closing comment, and if in the process you can address at least one of the questions that's been raised, it'll be welcome. And I think I'll start at the other end, Charlie, if I may, with you, and work my way down to Jane and myself at the set. So, uh, uh, roughly a minute each, and we really okay. will have to wrap up. Uh, on hypernationalism, yeah, I think it's a, it is a worry. I mean, if you look at the, at the number of countries in the world that have tilted in the direction of politics based on ethno-nationalism, including some of it here in India, uh, I, I think it's important to have voices of liberal politics, of pluralism that are out there. That's why I hope and believe that the liberal side of this more bifurcated international system will prosper to push out the message that ethno-nationalism is a dangerous organizing principle principle for political life. Quick answer on Elon Musk. Yes, they should have, and many of them do have, their own protocol and diplomatic offices. To Lynn's question, you know, it, it, it's much e harder to make the case for a global concert now that Russia has invaded Ukraine uh, and pushed Russia and China together, because a concert system assumes that there isn't an aggressor state. 
we now have an aggressor state that is seeking to overturn the territorial status quo. Does that mean that this proposal for these kind of small group systems is out the, out the door? No, but it means that we're going to have to figure out a way to kind of build back or build back better, as President Biden likes to say. But I, I do think it, we need to keep this in the back of our minds as we think about a potential end game in Ukraine. What end game will help us build a post-war working international system? Great. Danny? Uh, yes, on uh, peacekeeping, I'd like to stress, uh, as it is now, uh, peacekeeping is peacekeeping. It's not preventing uh, uh, a war. It's making sure that the result of a peace treaty or any kind of arrangement after a war is kept. And that's a very sensitive point that the United Nations has not crossed. It has not crossed into peace enforcing. It is staying in the field of peace uh, keeping. That's an important point. On nation building, or as it was called at the United Nations, uh, uh, nation, nation, th there was a concept developed at the United Nations uh, to... We uh, called it peace building. The peace, questioner called it nation building. Peace, yeah. peace building. Uh, peace building after internal conflict. I remember a United Nations debate mm -hmm. in which the concept was set. All the member states knew exactly what the idea was by the secretariat, by the organization. And you should have heard, I don't know if 193 speeches, but a large diversity of speeches which talked not about what should be done by the community, but how does every country see uh, uh, um, uh, peace building on its own perspective and interests? And this made sure that the concept of peace building at the United Nations does not fly. And if I'm not mistaken, still it is not flying at the United Nations. And that's one of the limitations and one of the flaws of the United Nations, as we have, I think... This was actually one of Kofi Annan's innovations. It was not from a member state. It was pushed by the Secretariat, and the member states were not entirely sure they liked it. Exactly. There you are. Exactly. And if I may add, this brings me back to the idea or to the suggestion that within the United Nations, uh, um, in the streamline of making uh, uh, decisions of wh how to do and how, what to do and how to do it, I think a big, bigger role should be given to the secretariat, like in a company, like the developer in a startup, to take Agreement. the idea from the bottom, mm. suggest to the secretariat, and then suggest to the member states what should be done, and then receive the uh, mandate or the laws or the ruling of what should be done. Nowadays, it's not working this way, and much has, is not being done uh, as we sh would expect it to be done. Thank you, Danny. Lakshmi. Just want to, I think many of the questions have been answered, but I would like to give perhaps a last message because this is our last um, inter intervention. So um, I think what we have to recognize is that the UN has made a major contribution, including in what uh, our colleague from South Africa was saying, in uh, addressing some of the issues of inequality, of racism, of development, uh, in a very sustained manner. And at least there has been uh, some addressing of those issues. So we need the United Nations, and uh, there is no question of that. But getting to reinvent it, reboot it, restart it, all of that, is the biggest challenge, particularly because of this geopolitical, geoeconomic divide, this binary that is emerging. And that's something that we will need to rethink as a global community, uh, and, and it, it is indeed one of the existential uh, dilemmas that we face. Absolutely. Arulat Mirzoyan. 
Um, well, I'm very sorry. I'm not going to answer any of the questions, okay. although although uh, each of them was being answered. Of course, uh, these were very serious questions. Instead, I would uh, I just remembered that uh, many years ago, when I was not a minister and a diplomat and a politician, uh, but uh, but a researcher at an, uh, at an institution. Um, I was studying the international relations and I was uh, wondering all the time whether everybody is comfortable and okay with the existing international relations system or mm -hmm. uh, not, or if not, how can the system be changed? And, and um, uh, by that time I did not have any answer and any idea of the conversation being opened. Now I can say that I'm glad that the conversation is open and the issues are being discussed and very seriously dis uh, discussed. And this means that probably we are not very far from the solutions. That sounds very optimistic. Good to hear that. <laughs> Jane. In every single one of our countries, there are organizations with people who wake up every single day thinking how they can steal your money. There are organizations with people who wake up every single day thinking about how they can kill other people. And the United Nations is an organization where people wake up every single day thinking about how to solve the world's problems. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect by a long shot. It's not perfect by a long shot. And what we've learned, you know, what countries like the United States, for example, recently has learned the hard way, is force can't do all that needs doing, and all that needs doing can't be done alone. And so while there's many opportunities for the United Nations. There are equally many opportunities for nations to unite, and it's about time they started doing so. That's wonderful. I'm going to just offer two closing comments myself. One is that, of course, the United Nations is a mirror of the world. It reflects our agreements and disagreements. It reflects our imperfections as well as our inequalities. And I think for us to expect greater perfection than that is not realistic. But the strong case made for it just now by Jane, by Lakshmi, by others, is, I think, the justification for persisting with it. There was a wonderful old uh, diplomat from the Soviet Union in the early 60s called Yakov Malik, who was an ambassador to the UN. Mm -hmm. And he would love to tell a story uh, whenever he was asked about the, uh, you know, how, how bad the UN was and why it needed to be got rid of. And he said that it reminded him, when he heard these critics, of a story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, Adam found that Eve was becoming a bit indifferent to him. And Adam said to Eve, Eve, is there someone else? You think about that for a minute. It's the same question you can ask about the UN. Is there someone else? Can there be anyone else? Is there any other organization that brings together all the countries of the world in a common forum? There isn't. That's the best defense for the UN. Thank you all very much, and thank, thank you, you for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.